Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Ari Yaris here at the Innovative Dad. And tonight's topic uh, on our uh, regular Facebook live chat uh, is going to be about self-esteem. It's something that we hear constantly about. This chat is high self-esteem. This chat is low self-esteem. But what exactly does that mean? And what are we looking for? And then more importantly, uh, we as parents, what is our role uh, in helping to our children develop uh, a good sense of self-esteem? Uh, what can we do uh, to help make that happen? Uh, and how does that fit into uh, raising uh, healthy and confident children? Uh, so we're going to dive into this great topic tonight, uh, hopefully come out with a handful of suggestions for things that we can do at home uh, to help our kids on a daily basis uh, with building uh, that great sense of uh, self-esteem that we want them uh, to have. So uh, without further ado, why don't we start with a basic definition? We always want to define our terms when we're talking about these psychological concepts and how they uh, mesh uh, with our parenting. So what is self-esteem? Self-esteem is how we think and feel about ourselves. It's uh, our self-evaluation and our self-worth. Uh, a synonym for it might be the word self-concept. It's how we think about ourselves. Uh, it might include the qualities and capabilities and ways of thinking that define a person. So you might say to yourself, I'm a good art artist or I'm a poor athlete uh, or a great singer, any of those things. Uh, and self-esteem has a, uh, a really strong correlation uh, with how a person's going to act in the future. Uh, kids who make statements about themselves like, I am shy, maybe sharing a, a history of feeling of, of being uneasy when they're meeting new people. The reverse is also true if they say that they like meeting new people. Uh, and it's not just a, a single solitary concept. I think one of the reasons that we find it so challenging uh, to talk about self-esteem and to understand self-esteem is that it is a multi-dimensional construct. Uh, and even in the psychological literature around this topic, uh, there have been uh, differences uh, and how it's defined and how it's discussed. Um, you could, uh, you know, just say the sort of global self-esteem is all of the aspects of an individual's talents and capabilities and accomplishments uh, and their personality. Uh, but we also, might also want to say that you could have academic self-esteem, social self-esteem, physical self-esteem, and that there are other areas that uh, researchers are breaking down to try and look at to see how uh, they impact. Uh, and just because your self-esteem is high in one subdomain of it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be high all across. Um, that you could have some variance there as well. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about levels of self-esteem. So things that we know about kids with self-esteem. So kids with low self-esteem may be hesitant to take risks or to move out of their comfort zone. And we're talking about general global self-esteem right now. Uh, they may often talk or think negatively about themselves. On the flip side, if we go to the other end of the spectrum, kids with high self-esteem may be described as cocky, boastful, or arrogant. Uh, and they could be perceived and therefore as threatening or as aggressive because of this very high level of self-esteem. Uh, so what we're looking for in our kids is uh, healthy self-esteem. It's somewhere right there in the middle. Uh, it's a more balanced level of self-esteem. It's not too guarded like those kids with low self-esteem, and it's not too egotistical like those kids with crazy high self-esteem. Uh, it balances thinking not too negatively about yourself and not too positively about yourself. Remember, you want to have self-confidence, but a little bit of self-doubt is also really helpful. Uh, we, can, that we use that in assessing risks, uh, and that's why this builds towards it being a healthy balance for self-esteem. Now, we know that healthy self-esteem is linked to a number of life factors, school success, feeling happy and satisfied, uh, making healthy lifestyle choices, having rewarding relationships, and demonstrating effective coping skills. These are all ways that help. These healthy self-esteem helps us approach uh, our life. Now, on the flip side, low self-esteem is related to uh, physical and mental health disorders. Uh, so children with lower self-esteem are more prone uh, to develop eating disorders or depression or anxiety. We've seen these as causative factors uh, in the development of those disorders. Okay, 
So let's talk a little bit about the development of healthy self-esteem. It is a really rather complex uh, topic and difficult uh, to tease out. Uh, again, because it's so multidimensional, because it's not straightforward, uh, we think uh, that self-esteem may be related to children's temperament. Now, if you remember back uh, to your early childhood class that you might have taken in college or uh, Psych 101, uh, temperament has to do with the overall presentation of a child. We usually talk about it in terms of the temperament of young babies. Um, and we see about temperaments being either easy, difficult, slow to warm, or among the major ones that we tend to talk about. Um, so we know that, and then we know that uh, research has also shown a strong connection to healthy self-esteem and early positive experiences uh, with others. Uh, so, you know, if a child is having these great positive early childhood experiences, there is a higher likelihood that that self-esteem uh, is going to be uh, stronger. Now, the other thing to be aware of is that uh, when we talk about self-esteem, the cultural valence of it uh, is significant because different cultures uh, value uh, different things. Uh, and we want to be aware of that when we're talking about self-esteem. So a culture uh, that is more reserved uh, is going to present with the different uh, formats of self-esteem. And those, when we talk about those subdomains, they're going to uh, vary differently. Um, we also know uh, that self-esteem over time uh, is relatively stable. Uh, but it is going to be impacted by ongoing patterns of failure or success. Uh, and we know that kids are affected about how much they feel loved and, and accepted. Uh, they, they need relationships that have high and reasonable expectations. And uh, adults who help them reach those expectations and support learning from mistakes. So, you know, this is really important uh, and, and something that uh, we want to be mindful of uh, when we're talking about trying to develop self-esteem uh, in our kids, that the, the environment that we're creating is really uh, critical uh, to that uh, happening. So let's dig deeper now into uh, what we can do as adults uh, to help build uh, that healthy sense of self-esteem and to get our kids to be uh, confident uh, and engaging uh, kids. We want them uh, to have that healthy balance. Okay, so let's start with step one. And, and these steps aren't in any particular order, uh, but I think each one of these uh, has the potential to be really critical. And a lot of them are, are things that we talk about as being uh, appropriate and helpful for uh, just good childhood development, but they really do tie into everything that we know uh, about self-esteem from the self-esteem research. So one, uh, listen to your kids. Um, we've all said this listening to me. Why don't you use your brain? Um, this is a place where you want to not just listen, but to engage your empathy uh, and, and to hear what the child is saying. Uh, use some of those repeat back skills. Uh, I'll post a link to a post that I've written earlier about how to use repeat back uh, with your kids to help build your sense of empathy uh, and to help make sure uh, that you're understanding uh, what it is that they're saying and that they're understanding uh, what you're saying. Uh, I talked a minute ago about just setting those appropriate boundaries and expectations. Uh, you want to set your expectations so that they are attainable, maybe with a little bit of a stretch, uh, because we do want our kids to reach. Uh, and we want those boundaries uh, to create safe spaces uh, for them. Critical uh, in all of this is teaching problem solving skills. And I think this is something uh, that maybe we as parents don't necessarily spend uh, as much time as we'd like to. I mean, I know that I often catch myself telling my own children, you know, go solve your problem, but I stop there. And I don't necessarily move to that next step in terms of, okay, well, let me coach you a little bit in terms of how uh, you're going to go about solving that problem to really build those skills. Uh, so some things that we would want to be talking about in teaching problem solving skills is clarifying uh, the problem that is, neat, that is 
creating the need for a decision. So, you know, define your problem. Uh, ask your child about how they are seeing it, hearing it, feeling it, about whatever that situation is and what they want changed. Uh, engage in some brainstorming around possible solutions. Um, most dilemmas have more than one solution. Sometimes we're often perseverating on, on the one that's right in front of us uh, and we're creating frustration because uh, we are fixated on that one individual uh, choice and we're not seeing the others. So engaging in some brainstorming can kind of loosen up our creative energies or your child's creative energies uh, and get us uh, to that point. And you know, maybe throwing out one alternative or two alternatives to your child might help broaden their horizons. Um, talk to your child about what the consequences are for the decisions uh, that they're making and they're engaging in, uh, in the problem solving. And you want to make sure that you're giving them the choice in this. Uh, and, and the best solution is the one that's going to solve the problem and make your child feel good about uh, him or herself. Now, of course, great problem solving means that afterwards uh, you're going uh, to take a step back and do a little bit of evaluation of that particular solution. Did it work well? Did it fail? Why? Why not? Uh, take a look at the tactics that uh, you, uh, were used and really have that conversation with your child, not necessarily in the moment because that a moment may be emotionally laden uh, and you don't want uh, to have that become a problem within it. Uh, but uh, take that time to think through it because going back and evaluating uh, a, your decision making, whether you're a child or an adult, is going to help you make better decisions later on. Okay. Um, a little bit about our own behavior. You need to model some confidence yourself, uh, even when you're not feeling it. Uh, your, your kids need to see you tackle uh, new tasks that, uh, with a sense of optimism as opposed to a woe is me uh, sense. Uh, you know, and that you're engaging in preparation and, and you're thinking about things. I don't pretend to be perfect. Uh, that's not what I'm, I'm saying here. Uh, but, but verbalize and externalize your confidence. Um, acknowledge any kind of anxiety that you might be happen, having, uh, but don't dwell on it. Don't perseverate on that. Focus on the positive things that you're doing to get ready for whatever it is that you're facing. Uh, because, you know, our Kids are watching our behavior constantly. So if we are letting our own self-esteem issues really be out there uh, for our children and we're not working on them, they're going to mirror those same behaviors. So if you've got a, a behavior that you don't like, working on that is going to help your kids. Um, it probably should go uh, without saying that um, we should, if we want to promote self-esteem, we need to value our children and provide unconditional positive regard and acceptance for them. You know, let them know that you love them no matter what's going to happen. Uh, if they win, if they lose, if the grades are bad, the grades are good. Um, you know, I often try and emphasize that we're, you know, when something is wrong, it's the behavior that's wrong, not the individual. Uh, and this behavior is a temporary thing. And you as my child or when I'm coaching a parent, uh, their child, you know, that's where the love is. Um, and that, you know, to think that uh, and to be explicit that you think your child is great, not just when they're doing well, uh, but at all times, uh, because that's going to help boost, or, boost that self-worth when they're in that moment when they're not feeling well about themselves. All right. I think I'm up to about step six here. Uh, this uh, moves directly into, you know, not getting upset about mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. And, you know, there's a, a term from design thinking uh, about failing forward fast and, and really setting up this, this ethos that it is okay uh, to fail. Uh, everybody fails. Uh, there are all those wonderful stories out there about great inventors and scientists uh, who have failed. You know, people like to talk about Einstein and his lack of school success, for example. Um, you want to, you know, relay to your kids and help them understand that uh, failure is not something that they should get, that should get in their way. Um, you know, they, they will fail, um, but, you know, you need to pick themselves back up and, and engage in this. Uh, and I think connected to this uh, is really uh, making sure that your home is free from harsh criticisms uh, and, and those uh, sort of negative self-talk that goes along with this, uh, or even what's coming out of our mouths sometimes. 
um, you know, telling a child uh, you're so lazy is not going to help motivate them. Uh, kids start to uh, absorb these negative messages uh, about themselves, and then they, they start to mirror them and connect them. Okay. Um, you want to make sure that you're praising effort and perseverance as part of this. Uh, don't uh, you know, encourage them not to give up at that first frustration or bail after that setback. Uh, they're not going to succeed at everything all the time, but that resilience component that we're always talking about is going to help out. Uh, and connected to that, you want to make sure that you're avoiding overpraising. Um, none of us, you know, as adults, like fake praise. It feels meh, awkward, and uncomfortable. Um, so, you know, telling a kid that they did great when they know that they screwed up by the numbers uh, is not uh, particularly helpful. Uh, but having a conversation with them, you know, uh, this wasn't your best uh, at bat. Um, but, you know, look, we all have off times, off games. Um, but I'm really proud that uh, you, 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 you stuck to it and, and you were there and you were present and you were trying to be engaged. Uh, and I know that, you know, the, the next time that you do whatever the activity is, uh, that you're going to really try and bring your A game. Um, and, you know, when you're, when you're doing this, you want to make sure that you're praising that effort rather than those fixed qualities. Um, focusing praise on results, like that getting that A or, or a fixed characteristic, like you're bright uh, or you're talented, uh, may impact kids' willingness to engage in activities or challenges that are going to affect that reputation that they think that they have. Um, so, you know, saying that you're working hard, you're getting better at doing uh, this, I'm proud of you for practicing. Uh, this kind of praise connects directly to that effort uh, and, uh, and trying to achieve goals, which I think is really important. All right. You also want to make sure that you're encouraging them to try new things, and I've talked a little bit about wanting to allow them to fail. Um, but, you know, don't just have them focus on that one thing that they're good at. You want them to expand their horizons, uh, engage and pick up new skills. Uh, so that they can find out that, you know, if I don't do well at something, it's not going to kill me. Uh, um, you know, it it's a great way to encourage them to engage in greater effort, and I think it's a skill that we want to see them have uh, as adults. Um, and, you know, of course, learning not to give up at that first frustration or, or uh, bail uh, after an immediate setback uh, it just it's it's an important life skill. Angela Duckworth talks about in her book that uh, grit, where she will not allow her daughters uh, to uh, drop out an app act, an activity after they've started it. They don't have to re-sign up for it the following year or season, whatever it is, but they do need to uh, finish it out if once they've started it. And I think that's a really good rule of thumb for most of us. Uh, there are circumstances if you see. Uh, that a particular activity is really causing some psychological distress in your child, then you may want to rethink really about sticking to your guns uh, on this. Uh, but I think that's the exception, not the norm. Um, and while you know, I did mention you want kids to really uh, expand their interest, you also want to help them figure out what their passion is. Um, this is part of helping them to identify a sense of uh, identity and finding a place where they do feel confident uh, and seeing a talent grow will boost self-esteem. Uh, Setting goals is also uh, really, really important. Um, I think this is something that as parents, uh, we don't necessarily do enough of, uh, verbalizing the goals that we're setting for ourselves and then uh, working with our kids to set goals. Um, whether these goals are large or small, it doesn't really matter. Uh, as your child is starting to express desires and dreams, if you're able to turn those into concrete, actionable goals, uh, maybe that are even uh, measurable, uh, and observable, those SMART goals that we like to talk about. Uh, you know, put them into a list of things they'd like to do and then maybe break down longer goals into smaller uh, objectives or benchmarks. Uh, in doing so, you are uh, really giving uh, them a sense that you value what they're interested in uh, and you're helping them build a skill that they're going to need the rest of their lives. We all have to do this in, in, in both uh, our, our vocations and our avocations. Um, critical to uh, developing a healthy sense of self-esteem is uh, 
letting kids make their own choices. I mean, this goes back into talking about failure. Uh, they're not going to learn from their failure if they feel that it was a decision that you made for them. Uh, this connects to their problem solving skills. Um, if you solve the problem for them, they're not going to grow as much. Uh, and, you know, have them start to figure out uh, what are the natural consequences are from the decisions that they're making. Uh, you know, if they go outside without a jacket, maybe let them. They made that decision. Let them figure out, oh, wait a second, 40 degrees is a lot colder than 60 degrees. Um, or whatever it is, allowing these natural consequences to help happen uh, will help them uh, refine and, and grow their ability uh, to make decisions uh, about their behavior, about their environment, about who they are. And then I think last but not least, um, you know, Laughter cures a lot of things, uh, and it helps a lot of things. And I would say uh, building an environment uh, where you laugh with your children and where you encourage them to laugh at themselves and where you laugh at yourself. And again, going back to modeling this behavior, um, you know, let's take a little bit of seriousness uh, out of all this. Um, if we can make light of, of some of the mistakes that we've made, some of the failures, the falls, um, then, you know, I think we're more likely to move on to that next challenge with the, at least the start of a smile uh, on our face uh, and some of that sense of optimism uh, that we need to have. Now, all of these things really do go into creating that great sense of, of healthy self-esteem uh, that we want uh, our kids to. Uh, to, to build, and it's, it's something that, uh, you know, don't focus on all of these at once, but, you know, as you're, you know, thinking about your parenting with your kids, um, maybe pick one or two of these items uh, and, and build out uh, how you're going to, to strengthen that uh, in your own behavior and how you're going to encourage something uh, within your child. So uh, that's just a little bit about uh, you know what we can do to raise confident kids and uh, the tools that we need uh, to have in place as parents to really build up uh, that strong self-esteem. And I think this is a place um, where it doesn't matter what the age is of, of your child, whether you're dealing with a toddler, uh, a, a tween, uh, a teenager, or even an adult child. Um, I think these are all things uh, that. Um, you know, we can use in bits and pieces to really help promote uh, a stronger sense of, of self-esteem uh, for our children. So I hope you found uh, this conversation tonight uh, about uh, building healthy, esteem, healthy, healthy self-esteem in our children uh, to be helpful and to be something uh, that you'll be able to look at uh, going forward. Uh, and helping your kids live uh, healthier, stronger lives. And, you know, and as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, healthy self-esteem really has some great correlations uh, with the life outcomes that we're all wishing uh, for our children in terms of, of, of school success, adult success, career success, uh, healthy lifestyle choices, and all of those things. So uh, that's been uh, our Facebook Live session uh, for this week. I will be back uh, in two weeks. Uh, for uh, another session and our topic at that next session is going to be talking about study skills uh, to support learning uh, and what we can do uh, to help our kids build some student skills uh, at home as parents. So uh, thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, this has been Dr. Ari Yaris uh, with another Facebook Live session here at the Innovative Dad. Uh, happy parenting, and I hope you take some steps to really help your kids uh, raise that uh, great sense of self-esteem we want them to have. Good night.